<sighs> well, welcome back to another edition of 42nd Street Pete's Grindhouse, Summer of Sleaze Edition. And I guess I should say I'm lucky to be here today because a uh, tornado touched down a town over. Um, a lot of people ain't got no power, a lot of trees down, a lot of like, what the fuck's going on? Well, everybody ignore global warming, this is what you fucking get. But anyway, let me take you back to 1979. A film called The Lady in Red, uh, starring Pamela Sue Martin, Robert Conrad, Christopher Lloyd, Louise Fletcher, uh, Dick Miller, uh, Robert Forrester, and some other familiar faces. Well, this sort of is like a, it uses like real characters like uh, Polly Hamilton, Anna Sage, and Jake Lingle, only Jake Lingle was not connected with Dillinger whatsoever. Matter of fact, Jack Lingle was connected with Al Capone, and I think one of Al Capone's guys did him in. But anyway, um, it starts off basically with uh, Polly going into town to sell some eggs and winding up in the middle of a bank robbery, where she's grabbed as a hostage by Mary Warnoff, of all people, and held onto the car and driven out and dropped off, and then is picked up by the police and, you know, media, frenzy, whatever. She meets Jake Lingle. Jake Lingle promises her was a bunch of shit, takes her home and takes her to an apartment and beds her, then sends her on, her on her way. So she goes back to her father, who's a complete religious fanatic, who starts calling her a whore and beating her up. So she leaves. She winds up in, I guess it's Chicago, in the garment district, working for the, this garment overseer, Dick Miller, who basically has knocked up one of the help and is pretty, pretty abusive and things like that. And there's some graphic shit going on because the one he knocked up must have had an abortion and starts bleeding all over the place. And, of course, he's not responsible. Basically, uh, basically, she leads a little bit of a revolution after, after the woman dies and after her friend is locked up after being ratted out by him. So they beat the shit out of him. And, of course, Polly's unemployed again. So she goes to work for one of those diamond dance places and finds out that the only way you're going to make any money here is a little bit on the side, which she gets caught, which she gets thrown in jail, and the warden is Nancy Parsons from Porky's. So things go basically bad in there. There's a lot of nudity. There's a lot of beatings. There's a lot of, you know, implied lesbian sex. But a deal is cut that Polly gets out and goes to work for one of the houses that this woman has a piece of, and has to send back 20 bucks a week. So she goes to work for Anna Sage, played by Louise Fletcher. And it's an upscale whorehouse. Um, there, you know, it's a classy place, except that the mob has a little run in, and this guy comes to collect, and his name is Frognose, a guy with a port wine stain on his face who's a sadist played by none other than Christopher Lloyd. And this isn't the lovable Christopher Lloyd from Taxi and Back to the Future. This is an insane, uh, sadistic Christopher Lloyd. So, things get turned sour there when basically he starts slapping girls around and wants this black girl to come upstairs with him and she basically gives him a bunch of shit and he basically kills her. So, the place is shut down. So, Anna Sage opens a diner with home cooking and... What happens is Polly starts dating this guy named Jimmy, played by uh, Robert Conrad, and a bunch of FBI people come in there and tell Anna Sage that basically you're going to get deported, and you know unless you cough somebody up, you're going. So she thinks that this guy is Dillinger, so she sets the whole thing up, and uh, they go to the Biograph Theater where it actually happened, and Dillinger or Jimmy is gunned down by the FBI in front of uh, an astonished Polly. Um, Lingle is there again and takes a picture, basically saying that she's a rat, which basically gets Frognose involved because she was a witness to what he did with the, the black chick. So, after being knowing that they were betrayed by Anna Sage, the few people that are left, this kid Eddie, this old bank robber named Pop, who's a cook, this black dude as a driver decide to rob a mob-run bank, which they do. So they rob the bank, but before that, the black dude goes in and whacks Frognose in a bar. Um, 
Back, backing up a bit, um, Polly spends a night with this hitman named Turk, played by Robert Forrester, and she's at a party when Turk pulls a hit with a gorilla mask on, and he's unmasked in front of her, but when she's brought in to ID him, she basically claims she has no idea who this guy is, and she never saw him before. So she gets a dozen roses saying, I owe you one. So basically, she sicks Turk on J Jake Lingo and kills him. They do rob the bank. It's a complete clusterfuck. The driver is shot in the head. Uh, Pop is mortally wounded. Eddie decides to hold them off at a gas station where the whole thing explodes. Polly and Pop get away, but Pop is mortally wounded and asks for the bullet. Uh, Polly runs away to a farmhouse with the sack full of money and basically buys a dress off of somebody and basically gets picked up by a truck driver and she's on her way to California. Well, it's a great film. Actually, if you like a lot of action, nudity, blood and boobs, you got it. But if you're expecting to see Robert Conrad shoot it out as Dillinger, you're not going to see this. Oddly, he's playing something like what happened in actuality. Because let me bring you to this book. Dillinger was supposedly killed there, yet here is a book by a criminologist named J. Robert Nash. Um, Dillinger, Dead or Alive. Now, if I can get this up here you're going to see that he got a letter in 1963 from a guy in California who claimed to be Dillinger, and the handwriting was analyzed, and it was close enough to Dillinger. So it looks like John faked everybody out and did get away to California. The uh, thing is, there was a couple tells in the actual killing of John Dillinger. Um, the whole thing was set up. you got to remember, the real Anna Sage was a prostitute, was running a house, and was going to get deported. So she gave up this guy who was basically dating Polly Hamilton. Um, the two tells are that Dillinger's sister quickly identified the body and, if, and at the funeral had a ton of concrete mixed with scrap steel poured into the grave. Then, there's no way you're ever going to dig that up. The other tell was that Melvin Purvis, the agent who shot Dillinger, committed suicide with the gun that he did shoot Dillinger. It's so much stuff comes out after the fact. I mean, J. Edgar Hoover denied the existence of the Mafia for decades and concentrated on going after with a vengeance these poor Oki bank robbers. Uh, the problem was that J. Edgar Hoover was owned by the Mafia, the group that he denied their existence, because they had him on gambling, and he was a closeted homosexual. So imagine how bad he looked when that Appalachia thing happened, when all these mobsters were running in all different directions. Um, also, Hoover was pretty much of a coward, because when the last of the real public enemies, Alvin Creepy Carpus of the Barker gang, was captured, Hoover wanted to be in on the capture, but waited until Carpus, Carpus was picked up and handcuffed before he went in to make the arrest. And Carpus even said this himself. Um, I actually was a fan of Dillinger. I got in a lot of trouble for being a fan of Dillinger in high school. I was reading about this crime shit, and basically they said that I had a warped mind. Takes me back to what really got Dillinger involved in the game. Um, basically, he was arrested as, as a teen for some infraction and was told to plead guilty because the judge that he was going to go up against was already told, you know, he'd be lenient. Unfortunately for John, the judge was switched at the last minute. This judge gave him a hard time with hardened criminals like Homer Van Meter, Charlie Mackey, and John Hamilton, who basically educated John Dillinger in the art of robbing banks, and he joined them after they got out. So that was the whole thing. John basically was put into a life of crime by a fucked up judge. And like I said, I was just judged as fucked up for reading this shit. But it was more interesting than reading about Winston Churchill or Theodore Roosevelt. So I didn't give a shit. So the way they played the whole thing in Lady in Red was that basically the Robert Conrad Dillinger never even had a gun. In fact, they planted a gun on him after the fact. And a few scenes later, I think the guy who played... Um, uh, Melvin Purvis, I think it was uh, Alan Vint or Jesse Vint, admitted that they killed the wrong guy. So, you know, here we go again with this, you know, re revising history type of thing, but it's true. They did kill the wrong guy. So, that's our show for today. Still no computer. I'm sitting here with this thing. I'm waiting for my computer to come back. I'm lucky I'm able to do this with the little bit of things I got. So, uh, we're still going. And as far as the book goes, I want to thank a lot of people who have bought it. You know, sales have been, you know, going along smoothly, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, because any sale is a good one. 
and I appreciate the comments and the kudos I've been getting. So, hey, keep it up. Book's still on sale. www.42ndstreetpeat.net's the website. So until next time, stay safe. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for tuning in. And we will catch you on the flip side.